Hey everyone, so in the last video we talked about how organizations can use uh, technical data and human safeguards in order to try to protect their um, information systems. So in this video we're going to focus on the technical and the data safeguards. Now for the technical safeguards, uh, there are five types of technical safeguards that we will go into some detail about. Identification and authentication, encryption, firewalls, malware protection, and designing for secure applications. Identification and authentication is how a service is able to tell that you are you and you have done plenty of identification and authentication before, probably using usernames and passwords. Uh, this is a type, this is one example of a type of identification and authentication that involves something that you know. You know your username and password, uh, so that's how you can authenticate that who you are, because theoretically you are the only person who knows your username and password, as long as you haven't been sharing your password, and as long as no one has managed to crack your account or something like that. The idea behind this is if you can prove who you are by reciting something that only you would know, then you must be you. Another example of this is if you ever get those security questions that ask you things like, what's your mother's middle, a maiden name or middle name? What is the name of the street that you grew up on? Uh, who is your favorite fifth grade teacher, et cetera, et cetera. That would be another piece of authentication based on what you know. There's another type of authentication uh, where they test something that you have that identifies you as yourself. This might come in the form of something known as smart cards, which work a little similar to those chips on your uh, credit or debit card or something like that. And in fact, those uh, could even be considered smart cards because they identify that you are you and that you're connected to your own bank account. But a smart card is a very specific type of card. Usually it is also associated with a PIN. So you put in a, let's say four digit number or something like that when you use that card. Now there's a number of countries where um, smart cards are actually used for identification. So it, imagine if your driver's license, you could actually plug that into something to show, hey, this is who I am on like an electronic level or something like that. Some computers even have smart card um, ports. At least some of the older computers have smart card ports. So you could plug your identification into your own computer and verify that you are who you say you are. Another type is a hardware authentication key. Usually it is a USB key that you um, plug into your computer and it generates a cryptographic response to a particular prompt that is given to it and a service that is asking for authentication through that hardware key is able to authenticate and say, hey, this is actually the key uh, that belongs to this user. So I know that this, it, it, this user is the one actually trying to log in. Uh, of course, you have to make sure that the key doesn't get stolen off of you and used, but yeah, you got that as an option. And some uh, organizations, even like within the United States or outside of the United States, but some organizations will use these physical hardware authentication keys to um, authenticate employees, make sure that they are who they say they are. Uh, this could also possibly count for uh, NFC based cards or you like wave an ID card around a sensor and it lets you into a door or something like that. Those are a little insecure, but I believe it counts. And then there's biometric authentication, uh, which measures what you are. Um, you are the only person with your particular fingerprint in theory, although fingerprint science is not everything it is cracked up to be from what I remember from reading studies a few years ago, but theoretically your fingerprint is unique or your uh, face 
is unique. So if they get a face scan of you, it's not going to look like anyone else. If you have, say, a phone that unlocks by looking at your face or something like that. So that biometric authentication is uh, another form of identification and authentication. No one else has your face. No one else has your fingerprint. So you are you by virtue of having your face and fingerprint. Um, it does get into some weird ship of Theseus kind of thing. I, you know, let's not get into that actually. But uh, you can use biometrics to identify yourself. So you have these three types of identification and authentication. What you know, what you have physically, and what you are. Um, now there's a service called Single Sign-On where you authenticate on one particular website and it, or one particular service or whatever, and it keeps you authenticated for multiple networks and systems and so on and so forth. An example is when you log into your My Hancock portal using the, that Alan Hancock single sign on uh, service. You're also logged into Canvas and Microsoft Office 365 and some of the Microsoft apps and all that kind of stuff. So that's a single sign on. You sign on, you sign in on one place and then you get to be signed in on multiple services that are controlled by multiple people because they all recognize the single sign-on type of infrastructure, which is a really interesting thing. Uh, it's interesting that Canvas was able to integrate uh, itself with single sign-on so that log logging into your Hancock portal also logs you into Canvas. Um, yeah, it's a, neat it's a neat principle. However, it does necessitate strong login credentials. Um, Ideally, uh, having a nice username and password plus some external thing like a smart card or a hardware authentication key or a biometric scan. If it's a really, really sensitive uh, system that you're logging into, you don't want to just rely on a username or password. If it, you are accessing really sensitive data using a single sign-on kind of system. Um, and that's just simply because, you know, if someone was able to break into your My Hancock portal, not only would they be able to access all of your uh, My Hancock stuff, you know, class schedule, uh, possibly drop you from a class or sign you up for way too many classes and rack up huge fees or something like that, but they could also get access to all of your emails and send phishing emails or stuff like that from your address. Uh, they could get into Canvas. Um, send very rude messages to other people in the class, all that kind of stuff. So you want to make sure your security for a single sign on uh, thing is good. Another example of this is if you sign up to certain websites with your Google account or your Facebook account or whatever other account you might have, um, then if your Google account gets broken into, uh, someone would have access to every single account that you used to, uh, your Google account to sign onto. So it is very important to have strong login credentials when you have a single sign on service like this. There's also multi-factor authentication, which I alluded to a little bit, but it's something that requires at least two pieces of identification and authentication. So for example, if you sign up for a website and they ask you for your phone number, and then when you sign into that website, you type in your username and your password, and then they ask you to enter the code that they texted you. And then you look at your phone and they texted you a number, and then you enter that code. By the way, that's a uh, what you have kind of authentication there. Uh, but that's multi-factor authentication because it's two forms of authentication. Another example is username, password, and a fingerprint scanner, or a smart card and a pin. Or if you are signing into a uh, building and you put in a fingerprint, and then you also enter in a five-digit password directly onto like a numpad that's right there or something like that. Uh, or if you do username, password, uh, USB authentication key. 
something like that would also be multi-factor authentication. Uh, it allows for more than just two pieces of authentication. Someone who's really uh, wanting to be secure could put in three or four or five different pieces of authentication just so that um, they're really sure that they're being secure. But multi-factor authentication is probably something you've seen. Say if you've had to enter in security questions after a username and a password, that would also be multi-factor authentication. That's uh, two pieces of what you know type of authentication there. All right, so now we're getting into encryption. Uh, encrypting data uh, involves transforming that information into something unintelligible. So I could take a message and do crazy math to it, and then that message looks like absolute garbled mess. No one would even tell that there's anything useful in there, potentially, if the encryption is done right. Now, the thing about the encryption is you encode that message into unintelligible data using some kind of key. And then when you pass your garbled message on to the recipient of the message, they also have a key that they can use to uh, unencode that message. So let's get into uh, a little bit of an example of what m m maybe some uh, metaphors, I guess, of what encryption actually looks like. So there's two types of encryption. There's symmetric encryption or there's asymmetric encryption. And the symmetric or asymmetric refers to the keys. Uh, like I said before, when you are sending an encrypted message, you use a key of some sort, which uh, is usually some really long number that you pass into a crazy math equation along with the message in order to encrypt it. But we can think of it as an actual uh, key. So you have a key. The recipient has a key. In symmetric encryption, the key is the same. So what you would do is you would, um, let's say you have a box with a lock on it. You put your message inside the box, you close the box, you put the lock on it, and you lock it. And you have a key to that lock um, if you ever need to open it. And then you pass that over to the recipient. The recipient uses their own key to open that same lock, and then they can get the message. And then they write a reply, uh, put, the, put their message back into that box, use the lock that you both have a key for to lock it up, pass it back to you. You use your key, which is the same as the recipient's key, unlock it and um, open it up. And there is a message in there, which is really helpful. Um, when you're doing some sort of symmetric encryption based communication, typically you and the other party are going to generate the key yourselves and um you know you'll generate the key for that conversation have your conversation and then you throw out the key and then if you ever need to talk to them again you're making a new symmetric key now there's a problem with uh, symmetric encryption which is if you are trying to communicate with someone uh that you're, you want to do symmetric encryption with and you're trying to agree on a key to use well, theoretically, someone could be intercepting in the middle, listening and seeing what key you use and making a copy of their own. And then they would be able to look inside of the locked box that you have, essentially sniff the messages that you are sending to each other. So symmetric key encryption does run into that issue if the key has not been agreed upon ahead of time, which is where we start to use asymmetric uh, encryption. Asymmetric encryption is also known as public key cryptography. The reason why is because uh, everyone involved in an asymmetric uh, encryption sort of conversation has two keys. They have a public key and a private key, um, which are essentially, because we're talking about internet data here, just very, very long passwords. But if I am expecting 
to engage in asymmetric encryption, I will have an, a public key and a private key at the ready. And those public keys and private keys have been generated by crazy math so that they are associated with each other. If that public key were for some reason to change, then the public key private key pair would no longer work and I'd have to make a new public and private key. They also have an expiration date. They only last for so long. And your browsers actually have their own public and private keys, which we'll talk about the reason why they do in just a little bit. But if I'm starting a piece of communication with someone else who, and we're doing a asymmetric uh, cryptography, what's going to happen is I am, we are going to exchange public keys. That's why it's the public key. We're, we're able to exchange them. I would be able to give out my public key to everyone else. So I have my public key, my private key, and their public key, the other person's public key. I will use all those and some crazy math in order to encode my message. I encode them using my public key, my private key, and the uh, other person's public key. And then I send them that garbled mess and they get that garbled mess and they apply some crazy math to that and their private key. And the crazy math just so works out that by applying their public key, they suddenly can see the message. And then if they want to reply, they will use their private key, their public key, and my public key to make a message that is intended specifically for me. And then I get that message and I use my private key to unlock it. Now, this, if you want to uh, think of a physical analogy, this might be uh, equivalent to, I have a whole bunch of locks and a key that works with all of those locks and only my locks, no one else's locks. The other person has a whole bunch of locks and a key that works with all of their locks. Now, if we want to exchange encrypted messages, we exchange locks. I get one of their locks and they get one of my locks. I then encode my message by writing it down on a piece of paper, putting it in the lockbox, and using their lock to lock it. I give that to them, and then they're able to open it because it's their lock that they can use their key for. Oh, and along with my message, maybe I uh, pass in one of my own um, my one of my own locks as well, so that they can use my lock uh, to then lock up their message and one of their own locks. So they lock that up, they send it to me, I can uh, open it because it's my lock that they use to lock the box. And then I get access to their message, which I can read and also the um, lock, their lock that uh, they gave me. So the nice thing about that is we don't have to pre-arrange a unique key for us and there's no uh, danger in someone um, eavesdropping and catching that key and then sniffing all of our message. They would have to be able to undo the locks that we create. They'd have to undo that encryption themselves, which would require them essentially guessing my private key or their private key, which would be really hard to do. Not impossible. There are ways to backdoor it, but it's possible. So it's really helpful for that. You don't have to rearrange a key. You don't have to transmit a key unencrypted. That's really nice. Um, downside being is that it takes quite a bit longer to do asymmetric, uh, a, to, to do asymmetric encryption than it does symmetric encryption because you're applying all these different keys in order to decode everything. So when it comes to encrypting, say something like web traffic using asymmetric only, might take a long time because you have to encrypt that request using a longer asymmetric process. Uh, the other person would have to decrypt that request using a longer process and then encrypt a new one, uh, uh, encrypt a response. Uh, I'd have to decrypt the response and so on and so forth. It would be really nice if we could use symmetric because it's just so much faster. We just lock, send, unlock, lock, send, unlock, and so on and so forth. It'd be a lot faster. Uh, well, luckily there are ways of making the symmetric uh, encryption more secure. And that's going to involve something called SSL. So we talked about HTTPS uh, quite a bit. I'm going to actually get into a little bit of what it does. Um, 
I'm gonna try not to make it too technical because there's a lot of technicalities to it, but we'll, we'll try to speed through it. So HTTPS means HTTP over SSL slash DLS. Uh, that's a lot of acronyms. HTTP is essentially how we communicate over the internet. That is a protocol that allows us to access websites and get information from websites and send information to websites using a series of requests and replies. Um, SSL is secure socket layer. TLS is transport layer uh, something. I already forgot. But that isn't necessarily as important. What that means is the SSL is a way to encrypt communication between two parties where you haven't already met each other before, so you haven't prearranged a symmetric encryption uh, key. It's a way to establish and verify a secure connection so that you know who that other person is, you know that they are who they say they are, they know that you are who you say you are, and then set up a, a secure encrypted uh, communication line. And then HTTP over SSL slash TLS essentially means that we set up this encrypted line and then send HTTP stuff through it so that we can actually visit websites and stuff. So it's a way for us to authenticate, make sure uh, we know who that website is and they know who we are, and then also uh, communicate securely without anyone being able to listen. Uh, it uses public key and symmetric cri cryptography, so both asymmetric and symmetric cryptography. Let's uh, talk about how that works. So when you are visiting a website using HTTPS, when your computer is making contact for the first time with a web server using HTTPS, here's what happens. Your computer and the server exchange and verify certificates uh, in order to verify, you know, I am who I say I am, and so on and so forth. Um, and you do that with asymmetric encryption. So you exchange your public keys and then you start encrypting yourself using uh, that asymmetric encryption that we talked about. You know, you both, you and the web server exchange your locks and start uh, encoding your messages using each other's locks. Uh, certificates, by the way, are issued and validated by some trusted third party. There's a select number of corporations that actually issue these uh, certificates so that websites can say, hey, uh, look at this certificate from this website. I am valid. And there are mathematical ways of validating that certificate as well. Then uh, once all that validation stuff has happened, uh, the what happens is you tend to create a symmetric encryption key for this session. So your computer is going to come up with a new key. It's a symmetric key. Uh, so you're, you're making two new keys, keeping one of them. And then you use that asymmetric encryption line that you were previously using to send the symmetric encryption key over uh, to the web server. And then you just stop using the asymmetric encryption whatsoever, and then you start communicating using symmetric encryption, which makes the communication quite a bit faster. So that's one way of doing it. Um, the other way of doing it is both the web server and your computer can actually do crazy math, and all the public and private keys and stuff to um, create a symmetric key. And it's a little weird how it works, but the nice thing about it is, um, you know, in the first option where you create the symmetric key and hand it over to the web server, the web server is actually going to retain a copy of that symmetric key. And anyone who is able to figure out what that symmetric key is later on, maybe by um, breaking into the web server or something like that, may be able to retroactively decode your communications with the website. So that would be bad. Uh, using this, uh, both parties doing weird math to use their public and private keys to create a new symmetric key. The nice thing about that is they don't need to do any sharing of any uh, actual key like that. They just share uh, a little bit of uh, each other's 
essentially they, they share a little bit of information that is part of the way through the process of this weird math. They do some weird math, they exchange, and then they do some more weird math. And then they both end up with the same value because of the way that the weird math is structured because uh, it, they all get weird math based on both the public, uh, both based on the server's keys and the computer's keys. It's very complicated. But at the end of the weird math, they have a very wild uh, numerical value or a piece of data or whatever, which they are using to create the symmetric key. And then they use uh, that symmetric key in order to communicate privately. And they also include uh, message authentication codes in the communication as a way of letting the other party know whether uh, data has been lost or there's some sort of tampering or something like that. So if I send um, a whole bunch of words, let's say 25 words uh, to the web server, I also include some sort of mathematical code that they can then plug my message into uh, some equation along with that mathematical code and verify, yes, this message is as intended. Everything lines up here. But if someone took my message, uh, swapped out some of the words in order to make it really insulting and then sent it along the way, the um, web server would look at the code, look at the message and say, oh, well, this uh, weird equation that I have tells me that the um, message doesn't actually align up with the authentication code, so something fishy is happening here, and so on and so forth. So uh, that is another way that HTTPS can secure communications with the website. With HTTPS, almost all of your data is encrypted. Uh, you need a little bit of data to that, that's decrypted in order to help your ISP and also all the intermediary servers route the data that you're sending to the website to the website. Uh, you need to essentially give the server infrastructure the directions that it needs in order to um, actually get it to its location. You can think of this as when you send a letter, the contents of the letter are theoretically private as long as nobody opens it up, but you still have to put the address on the outside so that the postal service knows where the letter needs to go. Now you give a little bit less information than just an address like that when you're using HTTPS. The actual website name itself is withheld. It's encoded within that uh, encrypted layer, but the uh, actual, um, so some of the uh, network addresses are going to be exposed. However, any data sent by the website, like, I don't know, sensitive banking information or medical records or something like that will be encrypted. So nobody will be able to see that. So it's safeguarding against things like sniffing or man in the middle, which um, is where people are actually listening into a, like listening into a uh, conversation of sorts between a computer and a web server and possibly interfering with the actual packets, redirecting them or changing the uh, data that's inside them or something like that. But if it's all encrypted, it's impossible to do. It also safeguards against phishing because of that authentication that we talked about. Um, when a computer and a server are doing that initial handshake where they're checking the certificates and stuff like that, that computer can verify, hey, this is a actually the website that I'm going to. So you know that you're most likely not being phished unless someone has actually taken over the web server itself and somehow managed to replace all the code in the website, in which case there'd be a lot bigger problems there. Uh, but that's also why uh, forcing your browser to only visit HTTPS websites, if at all possible, or using HTTPS links when you're sending links to uh, friends or something like that. That's why that is so important. So they have that guarantee that you, they're actually going to the website. And that's why um, noticing that, oh, well, this directed me to an HTTP version of this website. I should uh, go into Google or go into and like manually type in the website address myself with an HTTPS in front of it. That's why doing that can be so effective in preventing phishing. Can be. It's not 
Uh, so there, there could possibly be phishing websites with HTTPS in the name. So that's not 100%, but it's one possible sign that something may be wrong and that you should just leave the tab that you're currently on and open a new tab and try to get to the website the normal way. But yeah, it's really helpful in safeguarding against all that. I kind of just talked about all this already actually, but it guarantees that you're connecting to the correct server. So you're not gonna get anything like injected malware from the website, which is actually a thing. It's wild. You can, and it it's typically mitigated by browser security updates, but every once in a while there's a security vulnerability in a browser that allows for some kind of injected malware to start messing with your computer. Uh, that's always a bad situation when it happens, but it's pretty rare. Uh, there's also no disclosure of sensitive information, like I had talked about before, because of that encrypted layer. So yeah, make your website or make your web browser use HTTPS if at all possible. And I will have that Canvas page with some up-to-date recommendations on how to do it, either through your browser or with an extension. Next thing we got is a firewall, which is a computing device preventing unauthorized network access. It's either going to be some kind of specialized computing device that is plugged into a network or a program running on a computer or router. Maybe you have both your computer and router. Um, very likely if you have a router from your ISP and you didn't buy your own, you probably have a firewall of some sort running. If you're running a Windows computer, Windows Defender has a built-in firewall that works reasonably well. Most operating systems do have a firewall that's built in, although if you're using a Linux, you might have to do a little more configuration. Although I believe the Chrome OS uh, firewall actually has configuration already done, so you might be fine there. But regardless, it's designed to prevent people from accessing your network in an unauthorized manner. So a firewall is going to filter traffic coming from outside of a network. It's going to look at every request to access some sort of resource on the network, and it's going to filter it out. It's going to make sure that uh, people who are not authorized to access the network do not get in, and people who are authorized are able to get in. Uh, this might be based on where those that traffic is being sent from. So if there is some set of IP addresses that has been known to, I don't know, try to do uh, a whole bunch of DDoSs or something like that, um, then an up-to-date firewall might recognize, hey, this IP address is contacting us, this can't be good, and completely shut that down. Although in the case of a DDoS, um, it might just get so bogged down with denying these requests that it just crashes. But it might filter based on where those requests are being sent from. Another example is uh, if you have a uh, closed off network in a building where only employees who are actually physically in that building are allowed to access things like certain databases or whatever. And then someone, maybe an employee tries to access it while they're on their lunch break at the cafe across the street or something like that. Uh, if, if they are outside of the building's network and they're connected to the cafe's network, the building might not recognize who they are. And they say, hey, this is coming from outside. So we're going to completely filter this out. It's a possibility. Uh, it could also filter based on the contents of packets if it is able to see what is inside those packets. Now, a firewall on your computer is typically, um, it may or may not be able to actually decrypt uh, encrypted packets like that, um, which is fine typically because, you know, encrypted packets are typically coming from an HTTPS. Uh, server. However, uh, if someone is actually trying to do something weird on your own computer or a server or whatever, uh, those packets are likely not going to be encrypted. Um, I guess I guess I shouldn't say that for for sure, but 
if they're not, they're not able to establish a, a, a pre-communication with your computer in order to set up an encryption in an order to exchange public keys uh, or set up a symmetric encryption or something like that, then it might be hard for them to set up an encrypted, like send encrypted traffics in a way that your computer is able to read them and do something with and then have bad things happen because of that. That, that might be a little tricky. I don't want to say that it's impossible because I might get proven wrong at some point, especially since this is a video, but that's one way that, uh, another way that a firewall will filter is based on if the contents of the packets look really suspicious. Now there's a few different types of firewalls. There's perimeter versus internal. A perimeter firewall would uh, protect an entire uh, organization's network or an entire house's network or something like that. Um, it is the first thing that any packet that comes into the network would encounter and it would examine all of that traffic before letting anything else in versus an internal firewall which might uh, only handle a subset of the infrastructure within a network so maybe an internal firewall actually handles the um the uh anything going through the router so like the firewall connected to the router might be itself an internal firewall so a perimeter firewall would be everything that comes in and then if that gets split off to different areas uh maybe some of the traffic goes to the wi-fi router and stuff like that then that wi-fi router would be more of an internal firewall as well as the um firewalls on every computer that might be internal as well and then there's packet filtering versus more specific uh sophisticated uh packet filtering firewalls just filter based on the contents of packets or where they're coming from or stuff like that. There's a lot more sophisticated types of firewalls that we will not cover here, but uh, they do a lot uh, crazier of analysis in order to determine whether or not these fire these uh, packets that are coming in, this internet traffic is okay or not. Now, like I said, firewalls are often built into most operating systems and most routers, uh, although you can install third party firewalls as well um, but typically you don't necessarily need to uh, they might come in with anti-malware software more on that in just a sec but the uh, bog standard firewall uh, might be fine might uh, again that's the kind of thing where i don't want to make a definitive statement especially if that might be proven wrong uh, especially much later on so do your research and I'll try to give what recommendations I can. All right, so there's malware. Uh, we, I believe we talked about malware a little bit in the Fundamentals of Computers video, but it is software that is intentionally designed to do harm. Um, this is what we think about when we think about, uh, you know, bad things happening to computers because of malicious actors. We download a file and it installs a virus on our computer and bad things are happening i think is a very common picture of a vi of malware but there's a lot of different types of malware out there so i'll just kind of go through them real quick a virus in a computer is similar to what a virus does in a person it gets into the computer it starts making copies of itself and it injects some payload program that is meant to do damage maybe deleting files or taking up resources or something like that but it's going to get into a computer make copies of itself, take up more and more and more processor time and memory and hard disk space and kind of uh, give the computer a very slow and painful death. The worst of them will even embed themselves in really hard to clean areas of the computer where they might not be able to be removed. The absolute, absolute worst of them will embed themselves in the actual physical drivers of the hard disk or in the uh, BIOS of the computer or something like that. And at that point, those hardware devices are just not usable unless you do some really, really, really technical uh, work to get them out of there. Now, different types of viruses are a Trojan horse, which is meant to look like a different type of 
file, like maybe a movie or music or doc, like a Word document or PDF or something like that, but you download it and it secretly contains a virus that exploits whatever program that you open it up in, um, which is a possibility. Now, a lot of the programs like uh, Adobe Acrobat or Microsoft Word or stuff like that are a little better at stopping uh, viruses from embedding them or getting embedded into uh, the documents that they open. There's also viruses that are disguised as, let's say, songs or movies or something like that in the sense that they have the name of the song and then .exe or .bat or something like that at the very end. And people who don't recognize that those file types are actually programs and not songs or movies or something like that will open them up and all of a sudden they have a program running that's wrecking havoc on their system which was a pretty big thing in the LimeWire days. People would upload songs or viruses that, Trojan horses to be more specific, that pretended like they were songs, but they still had .exe at the very end, but unsuspecting people who didn't know what that was would download them and then click them. And then all of a sudden their family computer has a virus on it. So always check the file names of every file that you download to make sure that it's not an exe when you're not expecting it to be an exe file or dot bat or um for linux maybe dot sh or dot app image um i don't know what it is for mac os i don't even know if they use file extensions for programs in mac os uh there's also the worm it's still a virus it's replicating itself it is injecting its payload but rather than just replicating itself on the host machine, it's sending copies of itself out into the world in order to try to infect more computers. Uh, maybe computers on the same network. So if you download a uh, worm onto your own computer at your home Wi-Fi network, it might try to infect other computers of the same operating system that might be on your home Wi-Fi network as well. Or it might try to go out into the internet and see if it can find other things. So that can take up uh, resources on your own computer, but it can also take up network traffic on your network, sometimes bad enough to the point where it constitutes a denial of service attack. So that is pretty bad. So now we've got spyware, uh, which observes user actions and reports to the controller. Uh, it's going to possibly be something that's installed on a user's computer, uh, possibly even injected as a payload by a virus, but it, it, it in and of itself is not a virus. It is a separate program that just monitors what the user is doing. This could also take place of web tracking. Uh, a lot of people have made the case that um, Facebook, their use of web tracking constitutes spyware. Uh, I don't know what the state of it is currently, but I wouldn't be surprised if it still is spyware. Uh, similar things with Google or other companies that are out there, especially um, like Microsoft could be a pretty bad candidate for making spyware. I, I mean, you know, what could be arguably considered spyware, I should say, based on the way that they report metrics back to Microsoft uh, from programs that are running in Windows 10 and scraping out those programs from Windows 10 requires a lot of technical work and a bunch of work from an external operating system and all kinds of stuff. It's a mess. R regardless, uh, spyware is meant to spy on people, whether that is being installed on a user's computer and spying on them and reporting to a controller, or whether that is tracking them through the web and spying on all of their website activities to their controller in order for their controller to build an advertising profile or something. Notorious spyware might include something like Angry Birds. Uh, the original Angry Birds used to be spyware. In fact, it came out, I, be I believe it came out that they were trying to discover the sexuality of the people who were playing their game. For some reason, I don't know why. But that, a lot of reports came out about that. Also, Bonsai Buddy is a very old spyware. Um, 
uh, it was a purple gorilla that was supposed to act as a virtual assistant and it used a text-to-speech kind of thing. I believe this is Windows XP days or somewhere around there, but it was meant to be a personal assistant. It would keep track of your calendar, remind you of things, uh, tell jokes, um, speak to you in a very, very weird voice. But um, it was discovered to be uh, spyware and also it was collecting data on miners, which is not allowed, so the company had to shut all of that down. Now, funny enough, Fonzie Buddy was actually made in San Luis Obispo by a company that I believe is now defunct, but I could be wrong. But Fonzie Buddy is a central coast of California native. So two examples of spyware right here. One is a key logger. This is a program that specifically keeps track of every single key that you press, and it will send a file of every single key that you pressed to the controller. The idea here is that they will try to figure out usernames and passwords from this log of keys. So if you go to https colon slash slash www.bank.com and then immediately type in your username and password, the uh, attacker will see that URL, which looks promising. Hey, this is a bank website. And then immediately see a username and a password that or things that could be a username and a password. If your username and password is your first and last name, and then the password is like a whole bunch of stuff, you know, they might be able to reasonably guess within a few tries what your username and password is based on everything that is uh, following the URL for your bank website. So that's the idea with the keylogger. Um, they're trying to scrape uh, usernames and passwords usually, or some other type of sensitive data. And then there's Edware, which uh, will track you around uh, the web and stuff like that, uh, keep track of the things that you're doing on your computer even to try to build up a uh, profile of data for you and then serve you ads. And then there's ransomware, which is a little more recent than the others, although not all that recent by now. Um, it bars access to parts of your system or data or the entirety of your system or data until the ransom is paid. And the newer forms of ransomware also encrypt a whole bunch of stuff. And they promise that they will give you the decryption key once you pay up a very large sum of money, usually in some sort of cryptocurrency. Uh, so WannaCry has been huge. Um, there's some talk about whether or not uh, the actual decryption part of it is worthwhile for some people. You know, some people do want to collect the ransom, but it could be uh, it could be more worthwhile for some attackers, depending on their motive, to just encrypt everything and leave it as is, never to be decrypted again. Or they might just take the ransom and then provide a fake key or something like that. I mean, they might not, they might just not care whatsoever. So ransomware is particularly nasty. So here are some possible safeguards. Um, nothing will work 100% of the time and things might change as uh, different updates happen to the malware landscape, I suppose, but these might possibly help. They're not 100%, but they might possibly help. Also, I will say that uh, owning a Mac computer or an iPhone or an iPad or a Chrome OS computer or something like that is not in and of itself a safeguard. There might be fewer pieces of malware for all of those systems because typically uh, very important, like financial and medical and government work is done on Windows, so it's a juicier target, but that doesn't mean that you're safe. So do follow along with some of these safeguards. Uh, it is better to do something than nothing. The first is install anti-malware onto your computer. Um, the Any different um, IT department that you work for or uh, for a company you work for or for even Alan Hancock itself or something like that might have different recommendations 
Um, personally, I feel confident in saying that I don't recommend Avast because of Avast's history of being spyware. Um, I also feel confident in not recommending Norton and McAfee because they've been very bad for a very long time. Uh, it was one of the two has been known as the antivirus virus for a very long time. Uh, so I will try to have a good up-to-date recommendation in the Canvas page that is related to all of this, uh, all of these topics. Now, when you have an anti-malware program, um, it will actually periodically scan your computer to see if it sees anything that looks like possible malware. Uh, you want to set it up to scan frequently. Um, I would say a week at the uh, once a week at the very longest. Um, you want to check on that pretty frequently because you know, especially if you're downloading a lot of files all the time, you really want to make sure that there's nothing bad like that on your computer. Uh, you also want to update the malware definitions. What this has to do with is um, there's a lot of patterns in program code that can indicate that that code is malware. So for example, uh, ransomware, especially any ransomware that started out as WannaCry and then was modified to do a lot of different things, is still going to look like WannaCry. Um, if you have a new virus, it might just look like a previous virus that was already done if that virus doesn't really do any sort of new innovations. So these malware definitions help a malware program look at all the pieces of data on your computer and recognize, hey, this looks a lot like malware, and then it can quarantine it, meaning that it can't actually do anything bad, and ask you to review it in case it accidentally quarantined a Word document or something like that. It can also look for evidence that uh, some malware program has tampered with fi files or even embedded itself into files so that uh, when, if you give that file to someone else and they open it up, they also get that malware, which can be pretty nasty. So that's what the malware definitions are. You want to update them because people do innovate. There are innovations in the malware scene. And then the uh, security companies that actually uh, make anti-malware software will have to update their definitions so that their programs can actually recognize that malware and do something about it. So you want to do that frequently. Only open email attachments from known sources. Um, this can be a little trickier if you're in a large organization, let's say like Alan Hancock, where there might be any number of administrators emailing you about things or uh, students from your classes emailing you about your projects or something like that. So you want to verify who those people are and you want to scan through their message to make sure it's not an actual phishing message that they might be compromised or something like that. But you have to feel uh, you know, comfortable with who that person is before you open an email attachment. Uh, You'll, you'll be a lot safer if you only open email attachments from known sources. That doesn't mean that a known source can still send you a, or will never send you a bad email attachment because sometimes that can happen if their account gets compromised. But if you at least limit to opening email attachments only from known sources, you're kind of protecting yourself. So it's a good safeguard, even if it's not 100% perfect. Uh, you want to promptly install software updates uh, because software updates could be patching security holes that could allow malware to get in. So for example, uh, Microsoft Office could have security holes that would allow malware to infect your system through a Word document or something like that. So if they deliver an update, you should promptly install it in case it is patching something like that. And typically a software will alert you, hey, this is a really, really important one. You should update right now uh, if it's really, really bad. But even if it's not, uh, you want to do it just in case. Also, you want to make sure you're doing it from legitimate sources, so from the actual application itself, or make sure that you are on the company's website and not a fake phishing site or something like that, uh, or that you're done, that you're not downloading it from some random uh, repository of applications 
uh, just out of nowhere because sometimes uh, someone could upload a fake copy of that application to one of those websites. So you, you want to make sure that you're getting it from an official source. And then you want to browse the web carefully. Never click browser ads. Never, ever, ever click browser ads because it is completely possible to embed really bad code inside of browser ads, whether that is uh, malware in the form of something that's tracking you or malware in the form of something that could actually damage your computer or damage your files or something like that. Never click browser ads. If you want to continue looking at ads, what you should do is if you see a product that looks interesting, you should open up a new tab and search for the product yourself. Either go to the Storefronts website if it's something you're familiar with and look for that product or just Google the product and see what results you can find, but never click browser ads. My uh, recommendation would be to block them entirely because then you completely get rid of any chance of spyware or malware or something like that being embedded inside of ads, which is extremely common. I'll recommend a good ad blocker as well as uh, talk about the different browsers that actually allow ad blocking versus do weird things with ad blocking. But I will uh, talk about that in that Canvas page. And then you want to design for secure applications, especially when you're doing something like building a website or something like that. So all of your information systems should be created with security in mind first, because it's a lot harder to tack security onto an insecure system. For example, there's something called an SQL injection attack, where let's say you have some kind of form on a website for your company that is meant to give uh, whoever is accessing that form uh, some kind of report from a database or something like that. So they will enter in some details of information that they want. Those details get transformed into an SQL command which then gets sent to the database management system in order to actually create that report. And then they'll send that report back over to the website so that the user can see what that report looks like. However, it is very possible for the user to, instead of putting in, you know, different attributes they want or their name or whatever, they might instead put in their own SQL code, their own SQL code. I don't know why I've been saying SQL, their own SQL code. And if they put in their own SQL code like that, they could then do something really bad, like delete all the data in the database, or they could send all of the data to their computer in plain text so that they could download everything and then uh, sell it off or do whatever with it. So the idea is you can embed SQL code into something that looks like a normal interaction with a database form and it tricks the database management system into sharing, modifying, or deleting data that it really shouldn't be. The way you deal with that is called sanitizing inputs. You make sure that the input is actually what it's supposed to be, that there's no weird SQL code in there, that they're just putting in an input that they are supposed to be putting in. Uh, you can do something like, instead of having the user type in something, you could give them a predefined list of things that they can select from if they only can put in a predefined list anyway, or if they're actually entering new data into a form and they're putting in things like their name and their job title or whatever. Um, there are ways for uh, people to parse through those answers and sanitize them, make sure that there's no SQL code or anything like that. Strip any uh, weird parentheses or brackets or something that are out of place and just leave it with uh, you know, text that's not harmful. So sanitizing inputs, that's not going to be your job as someone more on the business side of things, but as long as you're making sure that it's being done, then that's really important. All right, all of that was technical safeguards. Now we're going to talk about data safeguards, the way that you can try to protect data from harm. So you're trying to protect all the databases and all the other organizational data, and that's going to be done through a mixture of database administration and data administration, except in the other order. 
So for data safeguards, you're going to define your data policies, uh, define the data rights and responsibilities, uh, define the rights enforced by authenticated user accounts. So making sure that uh, everyone who is accessing data is who they say they are, and also make sure that they are um, you know, accessing the data that they are supposed to be and not data that they're not supposed to be. Uh, you can encrypt data uh, in order to make sure that it's kept safe from prying eyes who aren't supposed to see it. Uh, this also works well with the authentication and stuff because then you can use um, things like asymmetric data or asymmetric encryption in order to keep things safe. Uh, backup and recovery procedures to make sure that the data is kept safe from things like disasters or accidental deletion. And then physical security, so no one can actually just plug a USB device in or something. You also have legal safeguards for data because there is some data that is considered highly sensitive, uh, like credit card data, consumer and financial data that is stored by financial institutions, and health data. Credit card data is uh, legally, all those protections are legally defined by the PCI DSS. There's the GLBA for financial data and HIPAA for health data. Now, with regards to the entirety of the United States, California tends to have slightly stronger uh, general data safeguards. So uh, safeguards for data, of, uh, any data that you have about a person that is possibly sensitive and identifying like their name and whatever interests and all that kind of stuff. Um, outside of the United States, it is much stronger. Uh, the European Union has some really strong data safeguard rules. So it depends on where you are and what type of data you're talking about, but it's always worth looking at the legal requirements for keeping data safe. So that is just a brief summary of the technical and data safeguards that you can use, uh, just keeping your hardware, software, and data safe from bad actors and at mistakes.